Hello, I'm Steve Liebman. The two stories you're about to see, although separated by vast distance and involving people of very different means and social circumstances, have one thing in common. They represent the ultimate betrayal of marital vows. The city of Melbourne is shocked and appalled by a brutal crime committed against a pregnant mother and her infant daughter. But first, the Harbour City is stunned as a prominent Sydney businessman enters into a deadly contract against his own wife. A contract to kill. The 27th of January, 1986. It's the Australia Day holiday weekend in the northern beachside suburb of Manly, a thriving tourist area that's beginning to rival Bondi as Sydney's most popular surfside destination. And the uncrowned king of Manly is Andrew Kalasic, millionaire businessman, restaurateur, hotelier, a much admired community benefactor and pillar of society. Jean Hay is an influential Manly councillor. Like most local community leaders, she's impressed with Kalasic's energy and enterprise. I think it was through the efforts of the Kalasic family, um, building the hotel and the, all the efforts that particularly Andrew did put in uh, to the uh, business community, both as a businessman and um, through the president of the Chamber of Commerce, and then he became chairman of the Tourist Promotions Committee, um, that he really built Manly up again. Andrew's wife, Megan, is his greatest supporter and a partner in his business and charity work, highly regarded by the local community. I never, ever heard Megan ever say a nasty thing about anybody. She didn't have a nasty bone in her body and she was the sweetest, nicest uh, woman you could ever meet. Andrew and Megan appear to be the perfect couple, but all is not as it seems. Andrew is unhappy in the relationship, and early on the morning of January the 27th, the marriage ends in the most dramatic of circumstances. Andrew and Megan have gone to bed. Megan is asleep, but Andrew lies awake as an intruder slips quietly into the house through an unlocked door. Once inside, he removes his shoes and climbs the stairs. He enters the bedroom and fires two shots at point-blank range into Megan's head, killing her instantly. Then, two more shots thud into Andrew's pillow narrowly missing him as he rolls off the bed Megan! in the nick of time. Megan, Jesus! The killer exits the house the same way he came in. Andrew Kalasic raises the alarm. Ambulance paramedics Otmar Niewak and Matt Davis are first at the scene. We saw a person on the bed um, there was a man kneeling at the foot of the bed um, who looked as if he was in distress. I found out later that it was uh, Mr Kalasic. Matt went over to check the patient. He checked her vital signs. With a swab, he uh, swabbed her cheek and there was, uh, there was two entry holes in her cheek. Detective Sergeant Bob Ingster arrives at the crime scene to find Andrew Kalasic sitting in the lounge room in his pyjamas, along with the other residents of the house, Kalasic's 19-year-old son, Andrew Jr., and his mother-in-law, May Carmichael. Ambulance officers were in attendance and uh, I was escorted into the, uh, the bedroom where I saw the body of Megan Kalasic uh, laying on the bed and there was a considerable amount of blood on her and on the bed and uh, I noticed two uh, bullet holes in her left cheek. The crime scene and the, uh, the circumstances that were obvious were quite bizarre. You know, I'd never heard of an instance where somebody uh, had been shot dead in bed. 
uh, alongside a, a partner. And then, of course, um, it was obvious that shots had been fired in the direction of where Mr Klesic was laying on the bed. And it was quite unexplainable, even at that early stage, as why he had not been struck himself. Later that morning, Detective Sergeant Mike Hagan is called in. On that morning, I was called out from the homicide squad and joined a team uh, from Manly Detectives, and we went to the crime scene. And we carried out our own observations. We looked at the facts and the issues of the crime scene, but something didn't gel, and we were highly suspicious of the circumstances that morning. Andrew Kalezic suggests that the killer may have entered through a balcony into the master bedroom. But it has a sliding screen door that makes a loud noise when it's moved, loud enough to awaken the intended victims. It appeared to us from our observations of the crime scene that this was a related killing. In other words, there was a relationship between the mastermind or the person who set this crime up, the actual killer and the victim. And we had a gut feeling that this was a related killing. A police ballistics expert quickly verifies that all the shots were fired at close range. And it was also uh, quite um, evident from the ballistics examination that the shots that were fired both into Megan Kalasic and in the direction of Andrew Kalasic were fired from the side of the bed um, occupied by Megan. And uh, it was quite obvious even at that stage that the distance that the uh, shots were discharged from the firearm was a, a very short distance. Insofar as the Andrew Kalasic was concerned, it would have been within probably about three feet. And it was quite amazing, even at that stage, as to why um, the shots missed him. So the intruder enters the house through an unlocked door, murders Megan Kalasic, and fires two shots at point blank range at Andrew. Yet miraculously, Andrew is able to make an escape and raise the alarm. Then, during a background check, detectives discover something that really makes them sit up and take notice. Just 17 days before her death, Megan is attacked in the driveway of her home. <coughs> Anthony is Kalezic's next door neighbour. And I heard uh, a bit of a scuffle, or some running in a scuffle, and uh, this blood curdling scream. And so, um, which sounded to me like it was out my, outside my window. I thought someone was being thrown off the balcony. So I decided, well, look, I better go out and see if I can help. I saw her fumbling for keys and trying to get in the front door, and she was pretty messed up. And I just said, oh, are look, okay? are you okay? Is everything okay? And she just said, you know, I've been mugged. You know, and I said, oh, really? So I thought, um, I said to her, I said, look, I'll come down and give you a hand. So we got in touch with um, the police and they came, came to, to the scene as well. It seems someone was determined to get rid of Megan Kalasic. Police are highly suspicious of Andrew, but they have no concrete evidence against him. Soon, though, a police informant will blow the case wide open. In the weeks after the murder of Sydney socialite Megan Kalasic, investigators are making little progress. They suspect her husband Andrew, but cannot find any concrete evidence against him, although inquiries have revealed he's having an affair with another woman. But then comes a breakthrough. The man heading up the investigation, Detective Sergeant Bob Inkster, receives a call from an old colleague Detective Sergeant Kevin Woods. Kevin told me that uh, he had received information from uh, an informant of his who uh, told him he knew about the circumstances uh, surrounding the murder of Megan Kalasic and in fact had previously been offered a contract to commit the murder. The informant is George Canellis, a career criminal who's cultivated a reputation for himself as a gun for hire, a hitman. Bob Inkster and two other officers visit Canellis. And uh, he outlined uh, to us uh, the circumstances about being approached to commit the murder um, some few weeks prior. He uh, told us of a, of a meeting he had um, 
uh, with a Mr. Bill Vandenberg, who supplied him with a, uh, a firearm, a 22 calibre uh, survival rifle. And uh, it was fitted with a uh, silencer, and uh, he was paid um, a sum of money with a promise that uh, on completion of the murder he'd be paid a much larger sum. That sum is $25,000 for the hit, with a down payment of $5,000. Canellis has no idea who's ordered the killing, just that his acquaintance, Bill Vandenberg, is the go-between. Canellis tells police this story. He drove to the Kalezich home and followed Megan when she went out. At a local shop, he actually stood right beside her. But then he got cold feet and aborted the planned hit. He then handed back the firearm and silencer to Vandenberg and decided to keep the $5,000 deposit. Canellis now tells detectives he was introduced to Vandenberg through Vandenberg's best friend, Kerry Oreck. Inkster convinces Canellis to wear a listening device and talk to Vandenberg and Oreck about the contract killing. The three of them meet, but the taped conversations do not reveal who ordered the killing. They do show that Vandenberg and Oreck knew about the murder in advance and that Oreck delivered the murder weapon to Vandenberg. Vandenberg then casually slips in a reference to a man named Warren. And it became obvious to us at that stage that he had to have been referring to Warren Elkins, who was uh, Andrew Kalasich's uh, close confidant and he was the person who was intended to take over the security contract of the hotel. Warren Elkins manages the nightclub at Kalezich's Manly Pacific Hotel and is pitching for its lucrative security contract. To get it, Elkins will do anything the boss asks of him, perhaps even to arrange the murder of Megan Kalezich. Because there's no direct evidence linking Kalezich to the killing, detectives decide to place Vandenberg, Oreck and Elkins under 24-hour surveillance. When nothing comes of that, Bob Inkster and Mike Hagen, armed with a search warrant, visit Bill Vandenberg, still believing him to be no more than a middleman. But Vandenberg drops a bombshell. In our conversation with Bill Vandenberg that morning, and it was quite surprising what he said, but he told us that he was the person responsible for the murder of Megan Kalaji. Another group of detectives raids the home of Kerry Oreck and are just as stunned when Oreck says to them, I know what you're here for. It's about that woman that Bill murdered. Meanwhile, Vandenberg details his murderous visit to the Kalezich home on the morning of January 27th. A downstairs doorway left open for him. Taking his shoes off and climbing the stairs. Entering the bedroom and shooting Megan twice. He later on told us that uh, by arrangement, he fired two shots into the pillow of uh, Andrew Kalasich after he had rolled off the bed and he then ran down the stairway and exited back out through the, the way in which he came. And uh, his version was um, totally consistent with the, the evidence of the crime scene. Detectives also search Vandenberg's car. Well, uh, there were two bullet holes in the, uh, the door trim on the, uh, the front passenger side door. And uh, what he told us is that uh, in his panic to get rid of the firearm, he accidentally uh, discharged two shots into the door and uh, those bullet holes were still quite evident. Megan Kalezich's funeral is a huge event. Undercover detectives mix with hundreds of mourners, including politicians, local identities, and of course Andrew and his extended family. It's testimony to the high esteem in which Megan was held. Meanwhile, Vandenberg tells detectives that he's thrown the murder weapon and silencer into the Lane Cove River. Police recover both, and tests confirm the cut-down 22 calibre rifle is in fact the murder weapon. Vandenberg is not prepared to name anyone else involved in the conspiracy and also fears the man he calls the big bloke, the man who ordered the murder. 
But Vandenberg does give them more information about the man he'd referred to as Warren, Kalezich's right-hand man, Warren Elkins. Police interview Elkins. Fearing that he'll be identified as the killer, he tells police that Andrew Kalezich had approached him to arrange his wife's murder. The murder was to be committed on the payment of money by Andrew Kalajic. In other words, he was the mastermind behind this. He was giving instructions, he was giving directions as to how his wife was to be killed. Elkins tells the story of his almost comical campaign to recruit a hitman. He heads for Sydney's sleazy King's Cross, where he eventually meets Bill Vandenberg, who then approaches his friend Kerry Orrick, who introduces him to George Canellis. Canellis accepts the job, then reneges, but he keeps the $5,000 deposit. When Vandenberg informs Elkins of the situation, Elkins warns him that the boss won't be happy and will seek revenge. He insists that the deposit be repaid and says the hit must be carried out no matter what. Meanwhile, Vandenberg freely tells detectives that he was also responsible for the first bungled attempt to kill Megan Kalezic 17 days prior to her eventual murder. Yes, he made full admissions as that um, he intended to murder Megan on that occasion. He said that he uh, hid behind a small vehicle that was parked outside the uh, the garage, he knew that Megan uh, would exit the, the garage through a, uh, a particular door. As she uh, exited that door, he put the gun up to her head, pulled the trigger, and it didn't uh, go off. And I would suggest that the reason it didn't go off is he, he'd failed to cock it. <coughs> that um, alerted Megan, she turned around, and in a panic, he struck her with the firearm. And he told us that uh, in striking her with the firearm, which he had fitted with a silencer at that stage, the actual silencer broke off and uh, he, he fled the scene with the uh, weapon minus the, uh, the silencer. Meanwhile, police today continued investigations at the Kalezic home at Fairlight. A silencer was later found uh, in the grounds of the, uh, the Kalezic home. Um, police using metal detectors and a, and a very thorough search after the uh, charging process had taken place. Elkins is reluctant to go on the record naming Kalezic as the mastermind of the murder plot. He greatly fears the man he calls the boss. He admits he arranged the killing, but denies he pulled the trigger. After his confession, Bill Vandenberg is charged with murder, attempted murder, conspiracy to murder and assault. Kerry Orrick is charged with conspiracy to murder. Detectives re-interview Andrew Kalezic. He tells them he and Megan may have been targets of assassins due to their work within the Croatian community or his pro-development campaign with the local Chamber of Commerce. Under instruction from his lawyer, Kalezic refuses to say any more, still leaving police with no direct connection between the shooter Vandenberg and the suspected mastermind Kalezic but they have uncovered another of Andrew's extramarital affairs. We're able to um, ascertain some information concerning a past relationship that Andrew had with a former employee, uh, a Lydia Ewerman. She was a very impressive lady and a, a lady of, of, of very good standing. And she told us of a, uh, a love affair that she had with Andrew that dated back some years and that went for some years. Lydia Human gives police the letters which confirm their affair while Andrew was still married to Megan. But is it motive enough to kill his wife? Investigators also discover that in 1973, Andrew Kalezic escaped injury after leaping from his car before it careered down a cliff near the family home with his wife and son still trapped inside. Amazingly, no one was injured. Bob Inkster is convinced that that was Andrew's first attempt to kill Megan. Inkster decides to arrest Andrew Kalasich. Yeah, Jesus, you better know what you're doing. You are under arrest. All right. 
Six months after Megan's slaying, Andrew Kalezic appears in court to face committal proceedings. He's represented by the eminent criminal lawyer Chester Porter QC, and the charges are dismissed due to insufficient evidence linking Kalezic directly to the murder. We knew we were always going to be up against it, but at the same time, we were in it for the long haul. And of course, um, we knew that um, somewhere down the, or some time down the track, um, Vandenberg was going to be sentenced, uh, as was Kerry Oric, and both of them were also most likely to give evidence to uh, support a Crown case against Andrew Kalezic. It was only a matter of time. But Kalezic is already planning to eliminate a key witness. This morning, he was at the local court. Andrew Kalezic has been charged with the murder of his wife, Megan. But the charges have been dismissed due to a lack of evidence. Aware that further evidence might implicate him, Andrew Kalezic pays $10,000 to Elkins to persuade Vandenberg to retract his evidence against him. Now, Kalezic's right-hand man, Warren Elkins, is arrested. He was uh, charged with conspiracy to pervert the course of justice, and he was also charged at that time with conspiracy to murder Bill Vandenberg. Offered indemnity from prosecution, Elkins admits to test firing the weapon in the presence of Andrew Kalezic. He fires into telephone books, lying up against a wall in Kalezic's private office. They found that the projectiles had actually gone through the telephone books and had dented the um, uh, aluminium ducting that went around the bottom of the, the, uh, the floor. We uh, later uh, executed a search warrant on that office. We found the, uh, the dents that were um, outlined to us by uh, Elkins. And behind the uh, ducting was some uh, very small pieces of paper uh, with some type on them. Elkins also tells police of no less than four previous bungled murder attempts on Megan Kalezic. Bill Vandenberg confirms his story. He told me that on one occasion, he walked up the top of the stairs and in the room immediately opposite the stairway on the left-hand side um, was a TV room and he saw a young boy laying on the floor there watching television and uh, he decided he wasn't going to go in and commit the crime at that time and he quietly exited the home without being caught. Inkster now knows there's enough evidence for the Attorney General to issue what's known as an ex officio indictment against Kalezic. In other words, a trial without a committal hearing. A year and a half after Megan's murder, Andrew Kalezic is finally made to face justice. Elkins has made a deal with prosecutors and gives vital evidence that helps finally convict Kalezic. Vandenberg, Elkins and Canellis all testify against him. Finally, after a 12-week trial in which Kalezic continues to protest his innocence, he's convicted and sentenced to life imprisonment. Our family is 100% behind Andrew and we're lodging an appeal. Kerry Oric is sentenced to life for conspiracy to murder. Bill Vandenberg also faces life in jail, but feels enormous guilt and remorse for bringing down his best friend, Kerry Oric. That was the catalyst then for Vandenberg with a tremendous amount of guilt, not only for the murder of Megan Kalezic, but being the reason why his best friend got life imprisonment, decided to end his life. Vandenberg takes an overdose of sleeping tablets and is later found dead in his cell. Warren Elkins, having done a deal with prosecutors, is sentenced to just five years in jail. Now, that should be the end of the story, but Andrew Kalezic has powerful friends, and after years of lobbying, a judicial inquiry is ordered into Kalezic's conviction, but it badly backfires. Kalezic had claimed all along that he was lying with his head on his pillow when the two bullets thudded into it. At the inquest, forensic expert Robert Barnes proves conclusively 
that Kalezic is a liar. In relation to the pillow, examination of that was able to show again conclusively that Mr Kalezic's head could not have been on the pillow because the trajectory, the path the bullet fired through that pillow was straight when the pillow was not compressed, whereas had his head been present on the pillow, it would have been curved when the pillow was not compressed. Robert Barnes also provides ballistic evidence to prove beyond doubt that the gun Bill Vandenberg threw into the Lane Cove River was the weapon that killed Megan Kalezic. The judicial inquiry confirms that Andrew Kalezic was complicit in the murder of his wife. From prison, Kalezic continues to campaign on his own behalf, which only causes his family more unnecessary grief. And I have a genuine um, sorrow for the family of, uh, of Andrew Kalezic, and they just simply don't deserve to be put under this type of pressure. Andrew Kalezic is due for parole in December 2011. May 2004. In the Victorian coastal town of Mornington, 37-year-old John Miles Sharp makes a televised appeal for information about his wife and infant daughter, missing since March. That's all I'm really worried about, my daughter. If I could just come forward and even if you don't ring me, just the media or police or her family. Observers, including police and friends of the missing woman, are skeptical. They see Sharp's body language and his strange eye movements as suspicious signs that he knows more than he's letting on. But the truth when it comes out is more blood chilling than even the most cynical observers could have imagined. And a quiet, ordinary man becomes the centre of a horror story that defies belief. The story of the Mornington Monster. New Zealand-born Anna Kemp meets fellow bank officer John Sharp in the early 90s. After a whirlwind romance, they marry in 1994 and later settle in Mornington, about 50 kilometres south of Melbourne. In August 2002, Anna gives birth to a daughter, Gracie Louise. The baby is born with a hip dysplasia, but Anna nurses her through it. She's a devoted mother, as her friend Samantha Jeffrey recalls. Gracie was everything to her. Anna didn't work out of the home. She was staying home um, and looking after Gracie. That was her role that she'd chosen. Um, and yeah, she was 100% there for Gracie and Gracie was what she was living for, I suppose. In November 2003, Anna becomes pregnant again. Another friend, Dawn Shaw, remembers Anna's reaction to the news. Anna was very excited. She'd always said that she didn't want one child. She never wanted Gracie to be on her own. So that once, as life goes on, once mum and dad are no longer there, at least Gracie would have somebody. So that was very important to Anna. She didn't want one child. We made a promise to each other, do you remember? That we'd only have one. But John Sharp seems less pleased about the impending birth of his second child. The times that I would visit, I was starting to see a change in his demeanour. Um, yeah, it, I don't think the, the announcement of her having a, a second child was something that John actually was happy about. It's going to be fine. How's it going to be fine? Just, he, he was almost like he was hostile towards her, which just struck me as odd because he'd always seemed a quite gentle, shy, retired person, and for him to you know, yell back at her in front of Gracie, I just thought that was rather strange and I, I can, you could feel the tension in the air between the two of them and they were obviously at odds. This is not okay! In March 2004, John and Anna Sharp move into a new house in Prince Street, Mornington. There's a coldness between them, but life seems to go on fairly normally. On Tuesday, March the 23rd, the expectant mum rings her health insurance company at around 2 p.m. to have the new baby added to the family's health cover. This is the last known contact she will have with the outside world. Samantha Jeffrey has made plans to get together with Anna later in the week. We're going to meet on the Friday morning. 
and everything was going fine. And then out of the blue on the Thursday, I get a phone call, and it's John. Have you, um, have you heard from Anna? I've never spoken to him on the phone before. I don't understand why he's calling, but I, you know, listened to what he had to say, and he said to me, Anna's left. And I said, OK. John Sharp also rings Dawn Shaw. I just thought it was odd that it was John ringing for starters at work. And I asked, you know, where Anna was, and he said that she'd left with another man and that she'd left Gracie behind, which immediately alarm bells rang. I had the hairs on the back of my neck. Um, stood up because I knew that Anna would never leave Gracie behind. There was no way Anna would have left her child behind. On Wednesday morning, Chris Rays, a TV antenna technician, arrives to do an adjustment that Anna had booked him for. Hello. Oh, hello. I'm, I'm here at repair area. John is reluctant to let Rays into the house, but the antenna man thinks he sees somebody else inside. I just had a feeling there's an older gent there in the house, probably standing like 10 feet behind him, just sort of in the background when we're talking to him at the door. Um, but I had no contact with that person again. I didn't see that person again, otherwise I'd have remembered. Subsequent police inquiries into Anna's disappearance turn up no sign of this older man in the Sharp home. On Friday, March the 26th, Sharp takes Gracie to preschool and tells staff she won't be returning. Later that day, he takes his daughter with him as he buys two spearheads for a spear gun he'd bought in January. In Dunedin, New Zealand, Anna's family becomes concerned when she doesn't respond to phone calls. Her mother, Lily, speaks to her parish priest, Father Tony Harrison. She told me that she had been trying to get a hold of Anna. Uh, she had talked, spoken to her on the Monday, and um, she then tried to get in touch with her, left numerous um, messages on her, um, the answer phone, but none of them were returned. There's something I have to tell you. While Father Harrison is visiting Lily, John Sharp calls her. And then when John Sharp rang up, he then told her that uh, Anna had left him for another man. And I still remember Lily saying, we don't do that. And the story was that Anna was going to come back on the Monday and pick Gracie up. John Sharp also tells Lily that this other man is the father of the child Anna is carrying. With Lily's agreement, Father Harrison contacts Constable John Woodhouse of Dunedin Police. I didn't think there was anything major in it. I thought initially that um, um, being a Catholic girl, perhaps she was ashamed at having left a husband for another man and she was worried that her mother's reaction to it may not have been positive. As the days pass, Anna's family becomes more and more concerned. Constable John Woodhouse tracks down the missing woman's local health centre at Mornington, and a nurse remembers Anna and says that she'd seemed upset about her husband's reaction to her pregnancy. I found that very curious, and that was a theme that, that was also expressed by Anna's friends and mother, that if... if... John Sharp's reaction to Anna's pregnancy didn't improve, it would spell the end of their marriage. You promised me you'd go back Now, that didn't make any sense to me at all, because if Anna had told John that she was pregnant to another man, why would she be at all concerned at John's reaction to her pregnancy? So I think it was a fair conclusion for me to draw that, that John Sharp was indeed the, f the father of that unborn child. Sharp tells Anna's friends and family that Anna had come to collect Gracie on Sunday the 28th of March and had left in a taxi. John Woodhouse rings Mornington and obtains the phone numbers of every taxi company operating in the town. None of the taxi firms that operated in that area had any record of, of any coll of collection from the Prince Street house. So that was another, um, was another point that just didn't add up. After making numerous attempts to contact John Sharp by phone, Constable Woodhouse puts together a case file which is sent to Australia. On May 20th, the file lands on the desk of Detective Sergeant Shane Brundell, 
of the Victoria Police Missing Persons Unit. Initially, we had uh, some concerns with um, the disappearance of Anna and Gracie, mainly because you're talking about a 41-year-old woman, um, married. Uh, all her background detailed, you know, that uh, uh, she was a responsible lady, um, who was a responsible mother, uh, a responsible wife, and also pregnant at the time as well. So her disappearance was totally out of character. So from in that light, we, we had some initial concerns for her disappearance. We went down to the Mornington area um, and we thought we'd start uh, with the husband um, in relation to uh, the disappearance and whether he had any information that might be able to assist us in, in locating them. She came and picked up Grace and she's staying with another man. After interviewing John Sharp and taking a detailed statement from him, police begin watching him closely. A couple of days later, he's seen to walk into bushes next to a public toilet in the Esplanade at Mornington. He picks up a blue plastic bag, takes out what appears to be a credit card, and then puts the bag back in its hiding place. Police check the bag and find that it contains Anna's mobile phone and her visa card. They later find her driver's license. At that point in time, that's when the suspicion certainly uh, grew uh, to the point where we firmly suspected that she had met with foul play um, and that John Sharp was then a, a prime suspect for her disappearance. 37-year-old John Sharp just wants to hear from his estranged wife, Anna Kemp. On May 26th, just over two months since Anna and Gracie's disappearance, John Sharp makes his televised appeal for his wife and daughter's return. Detective Constable Mark Kennedy of the Missing Persons Unit had taken Sharp's statement when he was first interviewed, but the man he sees on television is quite different. Um, I thought he was acting, quite obviously acting, um, pretending to be a concerned, emotional father and husband uh, and pretending to be terribly worried about them. Um, whereas when I took the statement and met him initially, he was a bit more matter-of-fact and less emotional, um, a bit more consistent in his answers. Um, and he actually said at one stage, I don't really care where Anna is, I just want to know where Gracie is. Whereas on TV, he was, quite, in my opinion, quite false, pretending to be concerned. And I continually said to Shane, I wish I had a dollar for every person who said to me, you know, this bloke's just pretending, he's acting, and he doesn't look real or, you know, truthful. Police are now convinced that Anna has met with foul play and that John Sharp is responsible, but they're leaving nothing to chance. They know Sharp has Anna's visa card and mobile phone. The visa card has been used to order flowers on the internet for Anna's mother, Lily. But Lily doesn't believe for a moment that the flowers are actually from Anna. Anna's mobile phone has also been used on a number of occasions since her disappearance. And strange emails have been sent to members of her family. Missing Persons Unit officers speak again to friends and relatives and grill John Sharp repeatedly, looking for a possible motive. We got to a stage where we were satisfied that we had sufficient evidence to arrest John Sharp um, as a result of all those inquiries and after speaking with countless people. And uh, so subsequently John was arrested and, and interviewed in relation to their disappearances. No, I've never heard Anna in my life. At first, Sharp sticks to his story that Anna has run off with another man, but the evidence against him is very strong. I, I knew that he was nearly there. I knew that he... It was nearly though he wanted to tell us, but he couldn't tell us. Yeah, so, yeah. And I, at one stage I thought, he wants to tell us, but he can't. And I actually said, John, do you want to write it down to tell us? It was nearly like he had a fear of saying it. After several hours, Sharp speaks to members of his family and then confesses to the murders of Anna and Gracie. I didn't want her to suffer anything, so I killed Anna and Gracie both when they were sleeping. But even the most case-hardened police officers aren't prepared for what John Miles Sharp tells them next, as he gives a horrendous account of how he slaughtered his wife, his daughter, and his unborn child.
On the afternoon of June the 22nd, 2004, John Miles Sharp confesses to the murder of his wife, Anna, and their infant daughter, Gracie. He then tells the arresting officers a chilling story that they can scarcely believe. By early 2004, Sharp is already planning to kill Anna, and he's decided on the weapon he'll use. In January, he buys a spear gun and two spears, paying in cash so the transaction can't be traced. On the evening of March the 23rd, he and Anna go to bed between 9 and 10. Anna quickly falls asleep, but John lies brooding about the problems in their marriage. He gets up, goes to the garage, and returns to the bedroom with the spear gun. He approaches the bed and fires the spear gun at close range, striking Anna in the temple. But the shot doesn't kill her. So he uses the second spear to finish her off. He then covers Anna's body in towels and goes downstairs to sleep on a sofa bed. The following morning, he attempts to remove the spears from Anna's head, but they won't budge. So he unscrews the shafts and leaves the spearheads embedded in Anna's temple. He drags her body downstairs and buries it in a shallow grave that he's already dug in the backyard. John Sharp has murdered his wife, it seems, simply because he can't face up to his marital problems. But this socially inept, weak and dependent man will soon commit an even more vile and heartless crime. On Saturday evening, four days after he's murdered Anna, and after attempting to convince her friends and family that she's left him for another man, Sharp puts Gracie into her cot at around nine o'clock. He has several drinks to numb his senses. Then goes to the garage to get his spear gun. He returns to Gracie's room, leans over her, and fires a spear into the left side of his daughter's head. Her father shoots her again. Then he shoots her a third time. Still, the little girl clings to life. Then Sharp pulls one of the spears out of her head and fires it again. This time, Gracie falls silent. To do that to your own child, I was just dumbfounded and just, I was you know, shocked. Yeah. And when, when he actually said it, I recall looking over at Shane to... I was so shocked to see Shane's reaction. The detail he went to and, and how matter-of-fact he detailed those circumstances it was cold, it was chilling, it was an eerie feeling and something that I have never experienced before in relation to uh, homicide interviews and it's something that I didn't particularly like and it's something I hope I never have to go through again. The morning after killing Gracie, Sharp removes the spears from her head. He covers his face with a towel so he doesn't have to look at what he's done to his own child. He wraps her body in garbage bags and a tarpaulin and dumps it at the Mornington Refuse Transfer Station along with the spear gun, the spears and some of Gracie's clothing and toys. A couple of days later, he buys two tarpaulins, some duct tape and a chainsaw. He digs up Anna's body and cuts it into three pieces. He then wraps up her remains and dumps them, along with the chainsaw, at the refuse transfer station. After Sharp has made his astonishing confession, the tragic news is relayed to Anna's family in New Zealand.
it was obviously a harrowing time for the family. The, um, the news that Anna and Grace had been placed in a, in a refuse tip was, um, was also horrendous news. Their loved daughter and um, sister had been treated in such a way. Police make plans to search the refuse transfer station where Sharp has dumped the remains of Anna and Gracie, but it's a daunting task. Inquiries with that transfer station showed the enormity of what we we're going to be in for because they then transfer all refuge to a, a, a huge landfill site down at Turong, which is also, um, you know, you've got uh, asbestos and other hazardous chemicals and materials also dumped at that location. Police volunteered for the search today, saying they wanted to help bring closure for Anna Kemp's family in New Zealand. As police gear up for a search of the Turong landfill site, the story dominates news headlines throughout Victoria and beyond. Anna Kemp's husband, John Miles Sharp of Mornington, has been charged with murder and is due back in court in November. It's important to investigators that information be carefully controlled. Media can work for you and it can work against you. Certainly when we uh, you know, became aware or the suspicions grew in relation to the uh, whereabouts of Anna and Gracie and, and the media hype grew, we had to implement a, a strategy to manage that. Um, and we wanted to make sure that uh, it didn't get out of control whereby the media were printing uh, information we certainly wanted to keep secret. Uh, for obvious reasons from an investigative point of view um, and also that uh, the media weren't um, stepping in areas that could potentially compromise uh, investigations. The search for the remains of Anna and Gracie begins in late June. It was wet, very cold, wet. Uh, it was raining all the time and windy and it had gum boots and protective gear on to protect us from the asbestos. So you, clothing got covered in mud and your boots got covered in mud. Despite the appalling conditions, there is no shortage of police volunteers. The man in charge of the investigation, Homicide Squad Chief Steve Francis, is approached by several officers who are prepared to put in extra time to find the bodies. They came to me and, and prior to finding Anna and Gracie, um, people come to me and said, we will continue to search uh, on our days off if we have to to find you know, Anna and Gracie, that's how important it was to me and to them. And uh, just reflects the dedication to the people that were involved in this investigation. So, you know, it, it's, um, it's, it's an honour for me to be involved with these people and just to see the dedication of police officers doing a tough job. As the search continues, police chaplain Jim Pilmer is a welcome presence for officers working under the most trying conditions. I have found that uh just being there, which sounds negative and passive, uh, is actually very valuable. And uh, uh, I had uh, some phone calls and, uh, and a letter uh, saying just that, you know, thanks for being there, when in fact I didn't think I did much. Uh, one, one feels that uh, there's, there's value in it, uh, even though at the time you don't think so. After days of intensive searching through thousands of tonnes of waste, there's a breakthrough. A tarpaulin is uncovered, containing some of Anna's remains. By mid-July, all of her remains have been unearthed. Then, searchers find Gracie's body. Shane and I carried Gracie out and carried her out up <coughs> through the landfill side up to the, to the main gates and we waited for the undertaker. And, um, and again, I was pleased for Lily and, and her family, her, her sons. Place for everyone, really, that we'd, that we'd found it. When the remains of both Anna and Gracie were located, um, there was a liaison officer appointed by New Zealand Police to deal directly with um, Anna's family in New Zealand. I understand that uh, they were relieved that uh, the remains were located. Constable John Woodhouse accompanies Anna's family to Mornington. We were able to have a, um, a funeral service at Mornington um, for Anna and Gracie and for the, 
for Anna's friends and um, um, acquaintances in, in Victoria, and that was an important part of the um, healing process before the funeral here. It was something that we wanted to do over there because um, there'd been so many people that Anna had been associated with and the, also the, um, uh, the, uh, the kindergarten people that, uh, that Gracie had gone to were able to be there. Um, and they were, you know, very, quite upset by the, by the whole incident. And also uh, members of John's family came to that. It was, I think Father Tony did an amazing job. It was, it was um, spiritual, it was healing, and, um, and a, um, a, a beautiful service, really, to, to what's uh, a um, horrendous episode. John Miles Sharp is sentenced to life imprisonment with a non-parole period of 33 years for the murder of his wife and daughter. He could not be charged over the death of the unborn child that Anna was carrying. Anna's family and friends are still struggling to come to terms with the horror of Sharp's crimes. It was um, heartbreaking, absolutely heartbreaking. I can't imagine anyone harming another person, let alone their own child, and that part probably disturbed me the most was that poor Gracie had done absolutely nothing to deserve anything that happened to her. I miss Anna a lot. Because she was my best friend, I have nobody like that that I could talk to. There's just little things I want to tell her. Sometimes you just want to talk. I don't have a mechanism anymore. She's gone. I'm never going to get It's a tragic story, but it's also a story of exceptional skill and dedication from police teams on both sides of the Tasman. If there are any heroes in this story, in my opinion, it is the, 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 the police officers that spent days and weeks toiling in that, um, that tip, which must have been a, a, an absolutely awful task, but they never gave up. For investigators like Shane Brundell, this is a case that won't easily be forgotten. It's, it's a healing process for us as, as much as anyone else. And, and with the passage of time, that, that gets a little easier. Uh, but it certainly makes you appreciate your own circumstances, um, your own family, and uh, you know, to cherish every moment that, that you have with them, knowing that there's people out there that uh, you know, resort to these sorts of means to, to eradicate their own families. It just makes you... You know, know how special and important your own families are too, for sure.